morning, everybody, and welcome to Cross Life, and welcome to week three of Advent. And if you notice up front here, we have two candles that we lit the first two weeks. Those are the purple candles, which represent kind of a time of penitence, sorrow, regret for things that we have done. But this week, week three, is a transition week where we go to joy and celebration, the birth of Jesus. So we're going to show a short video, and then Sumit is going to come up and talk to us about the theme of joy. Joy. We hear it, and we think of happiness or laughter. But true joy far outweighs any fleeting emotions. Like a beautiful garment, joy is a response that we clothe ourselves with. And at this time of year, it's our heart's cry as we bear witness again to the birth of the Savior. And let's face it, there's not a person here who couldn't use a little more joy these days. So you're invited into that quality of joy, whether your life is full of happiness or not. It's an invitation for every person, and it's here now, because Jesus is here now. This is joy. Welcome to Christmas. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sumit, and I will be lighting the candle of joy. It's the pink candle, as Larry said, uh, this December 17th. And I'm going to be reading scriptures from Luke. 1, 39 through 45, first, and then I'll uh, read another scripture of Luke as well. So, in Luke 1, 39 through 45, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a, to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, the second uh, Luke scripture that the pastor wanted me to read today, this morning, was two, Luke 2, from 8 through 11. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so that concludes that part. And then Pastor was saying, How is joy a part of my Christmas celebration? Well, I have just one word. And name, actually. And that's Jesus. Because, because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He helps us, knows us from when we were created till now. So, and that's what I believe is keeping the meaning of, the true meaning of Christmas alive. Because when I am able to help others that are less fortunate, not just during the Christmas time, but as a reflection throughout the year, it gives the understanding to share kindness to friends, family, and to those who we seldom show kindness to. For example, we were help, able to help the two families from Duckett's Lane Elementary. We were able to raise money this year. If we look back, look at how much we have accomplished. And it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of God. We, we, uh, we can't say, oh, we gathered this or we did this. The money we raised in DR for the laptops. So... This is how God can outreach us through Jesus during this time of year. Not just opening presents, but understanding the meaning of Christmas and how every day is a gift from God and our ability to glorify his holy name 
by the good works he has planned for us. There are many opportunities to experience joy other than the usual Christmas time, as I said, because there are many people outside this country who do not have the same privileges. I had a couple of opportunities to feed the homeless in my other church, and it's a real shocker that we can help others and really feel that inside joy, the joy that we get when we reach out and help others. Of course, and there's also soul winning. That, that is great because it glorifies Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. And now I'm going to light the pink candle. Okay. So we light the candle of joy with great rejoicing in the first advent and with great anticipation of the second advent of Christ. Well, good morning, Cross Life. So good to see everybody in the house today. Good morning. Yeah, you're alive and well. It's good. It's, it's the joy week, and so we're going to spread a little joy. And I got some real joy to, to share with you. We are in uh, the time of our service we call our, our offering time. Uh, and if you're new to us, we, we don't pass a plate here, but we do recognize the offerings that are given. And to be quite honest, we, it's, it's really exciting for me to share what uh, uh, we're doing or uh, have done uh, this, this past month, essentially. And so I, have, I got a lot to share. And so I, uh, I usually don't do this segment all the time, but I was really was, uh, I wanted to share uh, what's been going on. So if you haven't noticed, uh, the past two weeks, last week, that appeared in the back. Uh, so turn your heads, and you'll see that wonderful, beautiful 20th anniversary quilt um, that uh, was a labor of love from several people. Uh, I think Melissa and, and Patricia were the ones that came up with the idea, and um, just uh, the, the Crafters Fellowship group came together, and they put that together for us, and what a blessing that is, and you can see the scripture and the thoughts and all the blessings that is. So thank you, Vanessa. Thank you for your crafters group that went all the way. And just so you know, um, the crafters group made a whole bunch of other quilts, and they delivered them up to Frederick to uh, a recovery home up there. And uh, I know she shared with me that they did this last Monday, and it was just a blessing for, for those people that are going through recovery. They're in-house and they have these, these homemade quilts of love that they can just cover themselves with every night. And uh, just pray for them. Pray for that they feel the power of the Holy Spirit because it was the Holy Spirit that moved to be making those quilts. And so, man, that we have, a pro have an opportunity to be part of that. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you to the Quilters Group. What a blessing that is. And what an offering that is that we as a church can give beyond uh, just, just giving money, which is a good thing. You should give money. But uh, so if, if you are... Uh, a giver to the church. There's three ways that we do that. We do it through online. Uh, many people do it that way. We have a box here, and people mail things in as well, and so there's those opportunities. But I also want to tell you about the, the other giving that our church was able to do, because for years, we, we've asked people, we have a uh, item in our giving that goes to missions giving, um, and over the years, we've been able to collect a significant amount of money, and this year, we are giving away a good portion of that money. So if you can bring the slide up that shows the different organizations that we gave to and the amounts that we gave. So we gave $10,000 this month to uh, Lottie Moon, Annie Armstrong, which are the Southern Baptist missionary efforts, our local food pantry, the Crisis Pregnancy Center, which we give to normally. We just put a little bit more on top of that because of the work that they do. Kairos, if you didn't know it, is a prison ministry. It went specifically to the prison ministry in Jessup right here, uh, and we went to them. Helping Up Mission, if you don't know who they are, they're, they're in Baltimore. I've known folks that have gone through their program. It is probably one of the best recovery programs I have ever heard or seen. Amazing, and so I'm so glad this is the first time we'll be able to give to them. Building Families for Children is right here in Columbia, and they work with uh, helping families do adoption and foster care. Uh, tremendous organization, and they're always trying to bring in the, uh, the, the gospel message along with that. And then uh, there is in the Pimentel, where our DR connection, 
uh, where we do missions often, uh, there is a school that they have been given, essentially, and there's some mission work project that's going to be done, and we're helping fund that with $3,000. So thank you, Lord, for the hearts of those who will give and just <laughs> the blessing to be able to give that way. So if I may, let me just uh, enter into the time of prayer for this, uh, and then we'll get into our message. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for the hearts that have given over the years. Thank you for the hearts that just um, want to experience that joy that Samu talked about today, that joy that just gives of ourself. It's not, <laughs> it's not logical, but it's real and it's true. And Lord, I pray a blessing for all the gifts and all the givers that, that give with a heart of gratitude, that give with a cheerful heart. Lord, we ask your blessing upon them and upon the receivers of these gifts that the gospel message might go forth with power and strength in in the Spirit of God, that you be lifted and glorified. We thank you and praise you that we can be part of this. And we pray in the blessed, blessed name of Jesus. And everybody says, amen, amen. And one thing I also forgot is the the blessing of the, the gifts that we were able to get for the families here locally uh, to help celebrate Christmas there. Um, just so you know, we got a very sizable gift uh, that came through that helped fund all that, essentially. Um, so what a grateful blessing that was. We got that phone call last week, and uh, we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, uh, man, the heart of giving, the spirit of Christmas, it is alive and well. Don't you remember it? Don't you forget that? So, well, we are in our sermon series, uh, The Whole Journey, to Seek and Save the Lost, right? I remember, I don't remember much when I was 12 years old, but I remember this. Some things just stick in your mind. It, it, I was at my friend's house, and they had just moved to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, and their um, mother and father, my friend's mother and father, were getting ready to go out to dinner that night. Uh, my friend's father was a big guy. He was like 6'2", 275 pounds, and just a big guy. And his wife, her wedding rings dropped off somewhere in the grass. There's about a 20-yard place from the front door to their car. And let me tell you, um, tensions were high. <laughs> and... I, 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 rem- I still remember that tension, and I, and I remember we, everybody is then now feverishly going through the grass on our hands and knees trying to find these wedding rings, and, and uh, you know, it, it was at least 15 minutes, if not 20 minutes, and like I said, the temperature in the, in the outside was just going up, and it was, and, 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 and I, if I remember right, I actually think I was the one who found them in the grass somewhere, and so... Man, were we happy? Yes, we were happy for sure. (laughs) There's always great joy when something that is lost is now found, right? And uh, my wife just uh, left her credit card at a a coffee shop the other day. We were very happy when that turned up (laughs) and there was no charges on it either. But that's the point. But the point really is this, that there's greater joy, there's greater joy when it's a person who was lost, and then that is found. That's a big, big part of our lesson today. And we are, like I said, in the series to seek and save the lost there in Luke. If you have your Bibles there, you start getting to chapter 15. We're going to be starting for the, the, the first, um, first verses, first 15 verses there. And to be quite honest, this passage is one of the reasons why this series is named what it is. And we're going to be taking a look. And so today's the message is entitled, Great Joy Everywhere When the Lost Are Found. So if you've been with us through this series in the last two weeks, Jesus had dinner with some Pharisees. If you remember, he called them on the carpet for uh, their pride and their selfishness. Basically said, "It's, it's disqualifying you to go to heaven. In fact, Gentiles are going to heaven instead. And then last week, if you remember, he left that dinner party, and a large group of crowds started following Jesus. And Jesus said, well, if you really want to follow me, let me tell you what the deal is if you want to be my disciple. And so he begins to tell them, and he tells them, if you got ears to hear, you better listen, because what he tell, told them was quite important. And so 
now Jesus has moved on. Now he's having a meal with a group of sinners, and the Pharisees and the scribes strongly disapprove. In fact, they pretty much disapproved of anything Jesus did. But they definitely were disapproving with Jesus having dinner or eating a meal with these folks. So if you have found your way there to chapter 15, it will be on the screen. Uh, hopefully you have your Bibles in front of you as well. Uh, there's some good good verses here to underline as we go through. But starting in verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who need no repenting. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that had uh, that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Pray with me for just a moment. Father God, again, we thank you for the power of your word and the, the truth that Jesus shared with his disciples and with listeners to teach, to teach great truths. Father, as we go into this passage today, Father, we ask that you would indeed open up our hearts to this holy and divine word and let it speak to us as the Spirit moves in and through us and as your, as your Spirit has moved in this word. Lord, we ask that you would change us into your image today. In Jesus' name, amen. The scene... Jesus is not having a meal with the Pharisees, but he's having a meal with a group of sinners, a bunch of outcasts, those people, right? Sinners seem to like Jesus, though, for some reason. They seem to get a, gather around him, and it's because, really, Jesus was there to seek and save the lost. These people knew they were lost. The Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't. Now, it's interesting here because the tax collectors... Uh, and the sinners, there, there's two distinct groups here. The tax collectors, they get their own designation, <laughs> and for good reason. The Jews, they were Jews who worked for the Roman government and that taxed their Jewish brothers. Uh, St. John Chrys Chrysostom, uh, he was the pastor bishop over uh, Constantinople back in like the 300, late 300s, early 400s. He writes about this tax collector, folks. He says, the tax collector is the personification of licensed violence, of legal sin, of suspicious greed. They were loathed in every way. The synagogues would not accept their alms. The testimony, their testimony would not be received in a Jewish court, and they were held to be worse than heathens. <laughs> That's the tax collector. The other group was just the sinners, the folks that were involved in stealing and prostitution and the rest of that stuff, just those guys. But the view of the religious leaders towards such people uh, was, was this. You can find it actually in the Mishrad on a commentary on uh, Exodus 18. It says this. It says, a person should not associate with the godless and points out that the rabbis would not associate with such a person even to try to teach them the law. It's interesting about this, though, when you think about it. Jesus taught a stricter moral code, didn't he? He, he said we must, must forgive our enemies or love our enemies. And we're, if we lust, uh, you know, after someone, we've committed adultery. 
Jesus' code was, was much higher than theirs, but he would eat with those folks. Interesting in the Jewish teachings, they would accept a repentant sinner. If somebody actually came to them and were, were repenting, they would, they would you know, work with them. But the idea of God seeking after a sinner or a rabbi trying to convince somebody to, to repent, that was completely foreign to them. And this is a significant change, really, in the way God operated, at least the way they believed God had operate, operated, that God would seek us. It really speaks to the depth of God's love for us, doesn't it? So again, the believers, or the behavior, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, expose their problem, right? So let's spend a little bit more time understanding their problem. And if you're filling in blanks, here you go. The problem described here by the scribes and the Pharisees, their hearts were not in line with God's heart. And their complaining confirmed it. <laughs> their complaining confirmed it. Their, their, their heart was not in line with God's heart because God has a heart of love and forgiveness and mercy that these scribes and Pharisees did not know or understand. Now, it's a good place for us, a good word for us to, to check our hearts from time to time, is it? it or is my heart in line with God's? Now, it, here, we'll do a little self-check right now. So if anybody's sitting there and going, I can't believe that pastor's wearing that. Uh, why doesn't he wear a tie or a coat? Maybe your, your complaining is of revealing a heart Maybe it's about complaining with your spouse. Maybe your spouse should have been given grace and mercy instead of complaining, and your heart's not right. But let's go back to the Pharisees, their problem, their view. Their view of people who ignored the law, who were stealing and defrauding people, who had no moral code. Essentially, these people were harlots, those type of people, the sinners, how could a man of God hang out with those people? <laughs> How could a man of God eat with those people? The Pharisees' position was just, well, just damn them until they repent. That was their heart. But that's not the heart of Christ, is it? Well, why did Jesus hang out with sinners, you think? Because I think Jesus was trying to reveal the heart of God to them. That everyone, even though they sin, they were of great value to God. And that God still loved them. That's, that's why we have that wonderful verse that we all know, John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The irony for these Jewish leaders was essentially that throughout the years, the way Jewish leaders had behaved, they would kill their own prophets. They, their kings would worship ba the, ba the gods of Baal. Israel would fall away again and again, and God would bring them back again and again. And now they're being restored. They're t in this time in their life, uh, they have a temple. They're practicing the law. They have, they have good priests doing good things and sacrifices were taking place. And from their, from their point of view, all they're waiting for is God to bring the true Messiah so that it can be like it was when David was king. The religious leaders had no idea that they were actually in the same boat, in the same category as those tax collectors. Their pride had blinded them from understanding the heart of God. Pause for a minute. Can this happen to us? Can we be blinded to the heart of God from time to time? I think one of the most susceptible people to this are ones that are longtime Christians. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home and that's all you knew and you've, that, that's, that's kind of the way you've rolled all your life. I think those folks can often be the most susceptible to this. 
Because what happens over time, even though you're a good Christian, a lack of humility can well up in us before we even know it. And when humility is, is gone, pride sneaks right in. And one of the ways we solve that problem, the one of the ways the solutions to this problem is this. As Christians, if you're filling in blanks, here you go again. As Christians, we must never, never take Christ and His cross for granted. We must never take Christ and His cross for granted. What God did on the cross must keep us humble. That's why I think it's the most beautiful symbol of the Christian faith when we really look at it and understand what took place. It can keep us humble. So we understand the problem. Let us be on guard for this in our own lives, of course. So to deal with this heart issue of not knowing the heart of God, essentially, Jesus tells these scribes and these Pharisees, three parables. We're going to only look at two of the three parables. We're going to look at the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. The structure of these parables is very much the same. There is lostness, and then there's searching, and there's recovery leading to joy. We'll look at the parables together under that kind of outline. So lostness, and we'll look at searching, and recovery resulting in joy. But let me just give you kind of a main truth to this. As we go into these parables, I think the main truth is this. God is love. Amen? God is love. Yeah, we all agree to that one. And he is in the search and rescue business. <laughs> he is in the search and rescue business. And he actually includes us to be part of it. What an amazing thing. So let's dig into the two parables. Let's talk about lostness. The first parable says that there was one sheep out of a hundred that was lost, and there was one silver coin out of ten that was lost. Let's talk about the sheep first. One sheep out of a hundred, to be quite honest with you, isn't a lot. But it wouldn't be a huge impact to the, to the owner of the sheep so much. But for the shepherd to go after it anyway, this would communicate a heightened value of the sheep. And we all know a lot of times in these stories that Jesus is talking about, who are the sheep? You and me. Yeah. We're the sheep. No matter if you're a sinner, you have value. Because truthfully, we're all sinners. I love what Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ There is the lostness of the sheep, communicating great value. But what of the coin? What of the one silver coin out of ten? It was speculated that maybe that coin was worth a day's wages, worth looking for for certain. There is some real value in it. But I also heard a commentator talk about that there was probably a possible sentimental value to this as well. Apparently, there was a tradition in Jewish culture that a married woman would wear a headdress or have one after being married that had 10 silver coins in it, and it would mark that she would be married. And if indeed it was that coin that fell out of that headdress, we don't know that, that's speculation, but it's possible, that would communicate a great deal of sentimental value, wouldn't it? And isn't it true that God is our creator? And don't you think just maybe, just maybe, that, that God has some sentimental value towards you because he created you, because he loves you? What is lost may not seem important or worth the effort of searching, but God is telling us we are. <laughs> we are worth searching and going after. And if God thinks that way about lost people who are sinners, which we all are, 
truth is, we must think the same way. So what do we learn from the lostness of these parables? Well, I think it can go like this. Are the people around us, the ones we don't know, the ones we may not like, worth searching for, worth sharing the gospel with? God's heart says yes, right? So must our heart. Folks, I'm guilty of this as probably as you are as well. We look and we see society and we see the things going on and, and to be quite honest, hatred kind of wells up in us. And we have to stop and think, are they a sinner lost themselves or from Christ? I, I was reminded of a story that happened when I, again, one of these childhood flashbacks I'm having. I don't know what's going on here, but um, uh, there were some times when I wasn't a very good, I, was, I didn't grow, I wasn't a Christian kid when I grew up, so I did some things, uh, and this is one of them. So me and one of my buddies uh, were out on Christmas season, and um, we decided it would be a fun thing to tear people's lights off. And, and rip them off their trees and bushes and smash all the light bulbs in the street. Yes, I did do that. And one, and, 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 and one, time, one time, one of the owners saw us, and he chased me. I mean, chased me. I, I was like, how does this old guy keep up with me? And, and, but he did, and finally I got so tired I had to stop. And he got, came up to me, and he just gave me the riot business. I'm like, he doesn't know who I am, so I'm just going to, you know. Uh, but I, I would have to say that that man probably went back to his house, talked to his wife, and said, I can't believe this generation. They don't have any respect for anything. They, these kids are going to hell in a handbasket. I have to believe that's probably what he was thinking or said to his wife. And when we look at the world today, we want to go there. But for some reason, God said, I love these people. So must our heart be in line with God. We have to look. We've looked at the lostness. We've now looked at the searching part of this, these two parables. Let's talk about, let's look at the searching part, I'm sorry. The shepherds, they leave their sheep and they go into the countryside. Don't forget, in John 10, 14, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, doesn't he? Yeah. But I'm going I'm to go down a little bit of a trail here today, and it really, I think, it's going to show the indictment, essentially, against the Pharisees and the scribes. But we're going to have to look into the Old Testament, to a place where you probably wouldn't think you're going to find a Christmas prophecy, but you're going to find one there. And it's in Ezekiel 34. So if you do have your Bibles there, you can turn there. I will have this up on the screen as well. But there's definitely some verses worth underlining here. Yeah, God or Jesus, he's the good shepherd. He's the one searching for the lost sheep in this parable. But there's also, in this particular passage, a reference to shepherds as not God, but as the religious leaders of the day. And that's where you need to understand where this is coming from. So let me pick up in, uh, here in verse 1 of chapter 34. He says, The word of the Lord came to me. This is the prophet Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. That's the, not, that's the religious leaders he's talking about. Prophesy to them, even to the shepherds, he says, thus saith the Lord God, uh, the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness, you have ruled them. Folks, that was going on in Jesus' day. Ezekiel goes on in this, in this clear 
condemnation against the shepherds, the, the religious leaders, and basically says, I'm taking over. <laughs> Listen to what he says later in verse 23. And he says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. Just so you know, David's been dead for 500 years, so this is not literally David, but the son of David, who happens to be, you know. And he, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, listen, shall be prince among them. And, the, and I am the Lord, and I have spoken, and I will make a covenant with peace with them and banish the wild beasts from their land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Underline, if you didn't already notice it, shall be a prince among them. Underline that there will be a covenant of peace. Go into Isaiah chapter 9. What does it tell you? That he will be the prince of peace. Both prophets telling us that Jesus will be our shepherd. Jesus will lead us. Jesus will care for us. So that's how the shepherds can be viewed. What about the woman? The woman in her searching. The Bible tells us that she searches diligently diligently. I, I remember, uh, this wasn't my childhood story, this was a story when my young, uh, second son was about two years old. I think I've shared this one before, but we were at a, a mountain resort, a ski resort, and um, our Kyle, little Kyle, um, he thought we were thought he was playing in the, in the room, but he had heard his cousins and brother and sister downstairs playing outside, and I guess he decided to go find them. And somehow he left the room and slipped out the front door. And when we went to go see him, we thought playing in his room with the cars, he was gone. Diligently did we look. <laughs> Frantically, I will say, we looked. And we were quite concerned because they had little gazebos with hot tubs, <laughs> which I'm like, we're hoping he doesn't fall in. But we diligently looked with all our heart and with all our passion. And I think that's what the, the woman is doing. She, so she sweeps her house. And another interesting tidbit I learned this week, too, is that uh, in those days, they, they, didn't, they, wouldn't necessarily, they had dirt floors, but they would put a, like a straw or a hay substance that acted essentially like a carpet uh, so they didn't have to walk on dirt. Okay, it makes sense. So just think about your house having a, a layer of an uh, inch thick of straw on your floor, and that was your flooring, um, and having dropped a coin in it, <laughs> and then having to take your whole house and essentially sweeping up all that stuff and sifting through it to see if you can find the coin. And the search was quite cumbersome. This is what we can learn, I think, from the searching here. Searching, the heart of God is filled with compassion, and he seeks for us. And folks, it's personal. <laughs> it's personal. I don't know about you, but I, I, if you're a believer here, or you're listening online, if you're a believer, you probably can go back to that point in time somewhere in your walk, in your life, either through your parents, you growing up, that God was, was seeking you. God was searching for you. I can remember very specific times when I was away from God, before I became a Christian, where God was showing me, I'm here. <laughs> you, need to, you need to accept the gift that I'm offering you. He seeks after us, and he does it diligently and with compassion and personally for each one of us. So we've looked again at the, the lostness here. We've looked at the searching in these two parables. Now let's look at the last part, the recovery that leads to joy or leading to joy. Both the sheep and the coins are found, right? And what happens next is really important because, it re, again, it reveals the heart of God. 
In verse 7 it says, Just so, I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. There's joy over one. It's personal. And don't, don't get a little confused where he talks about the 99 righteous people who need no repentance. I think he was just... Um, humoring the, the scribes and the Pharisees because they thought they were like that. <laughs> because we know we're all lost sinners. We're all falling short of the glory of God. But God in heaven, it says there's more rejoicing than when one sinner turns to Him. Same thing in, in verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before angels of God over the one sinner who repents. God and his angels rejoice. Heaven rejoices. Amen? When one person comes into relationship with God. That's the heart of God. I'm reminded by what Peter says in, in first, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, And the Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing anyone to perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's the heart of God. That's our Savior. And I thought about this story. And I, I want you to see a contrast for a moment. We'll go back to the sheep. And this, this would be me and maybe the Pharisees, and you can jump in this crowd if you want to. But if it were me looking for one lost sheep, I would be like, okay, I found the sheep. I would get my rope. I'd tie my rope around him. I would yank that sheep, and then I would start berating that sheep like he could understand what I said. How could you run off, you stupid sheep? You're ignorant. You're dumb. And I'm about to kick you, but come on. That's what I would do. I don't know if you guys would be so harsh. He took me off schedule, you know. Can't be off schedule. But that's not what God does, does it? I love what it says in this story. It does, Jesus doesn't put a rope around this sheep. He takes it, he picks it up, and he puts it over his shoulder. What an act of caring. What an act of love. And think about it this way. That sheep is a sinner, right? As sinners, don't we get to the point where we've wandered off and away from God? And we actually get to the point sometimes where we're so broken, we can't even get back to God. We're so broken over our own sinfulness or what we've done has walked us away so far. But Jesus is there to pick us up and put us on his shoulder. Have you ever pictured yourself as a lost sheep laying on the shoulders of Christ? It is a beautiful picture it reminds me what it says at the end of Psalm 28 where David writes and says, be their shepherd and carry them forever. The last aspect of this recovery leading to joy, the Scripture mentions this, and I think it's really about us. I think it's for us. And let me give you the fill in the blanks first. But recovery leading to joy Folks, Christians and the church in particular are to greatly celebrate the salvation of a sinner. We are to greatly celebrate. Listen to what again it says, verse 6. He says, and he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Verse 9, and when they found, found the coin, she called together her friends and her neighbors, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that had been lost. Someone gets saved, and the church should celebrate. The church should celebrate. Individually, we should celebrate. And sometimes I think, and, and, and maybe I'm guilty of this as, as well sometimes, oh, yeah, so I so got saved. Pooh, cool. Really? Just cool? <laughs> 
Folks, it's outstanding when a sinner leaves the, the life of sinfulness and walks with Christ and is in, in, in heaven forever. It is a tremendous place. And it really shouldn't be just about high-fiving or, or giving the fist bump. It really should be about celebrating. When I say celebrating, I, I, I mean if somebody gets saved, that you're there ready to, to walk with them and to encourage them. Send them a note of encouragement. Send, send, send them, give them hugs. We got some huggers in this church, right? Man, give, give them some hugs. Folks, I, I think sometimes we miss it. And I'm guilty of it too. There is great, great power when the community, and this is what you see in the scriptures, the community comes together and celebrates, the church celebrates ultimately. What about when someone walks away from their faith and then they come back? Should we celebrate? Absolutely. Absolutely. What about somebody that, that gets baptized? We love baptizing people here. It is a celebration. It is a wonderful time. And we should encourage and strengthen people in that. The contrast is in the, in the Scripture here. The Pharisees grumble. They have no joy. The believer celebrates and has all kinds of joy when the lost is found. I love the, the hymn, Amazing Grace, right? Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, now I'm found. You know why that song is the greatest Christian song, greatest Christian hymn ever? Because it is an anthem of celebration of being lost and then being found. That's why that song is the greatest. Because that's what God wants his church to do, is to celebrate. We are in the week of Advent joy. And joy goes beyond just being happy, and, and, but it does include being happy and celebrating. Joy because we have a Savior whose heart seeks and saves the lost. And let's be filled with joy this week because what God has shown us, that there is joy in heaven every time a sinner repents. Amen? And it is kind of with that theme or with that thought, I want us to end the service today by celebrating communion today together. Because it is a celebration, isn't it? It's worth celebrating. The lives that are being changed in this room, those that are online, your own experience. And as we take the supper today, imagine... Jesus carrying the sheep, right? His burden of love. But Jesus also carried something else on his shoulders. The cross. At home, we have a manger scene, similar to the one that's right outside here. This year, a nice white cross that sits behind it because the manger scene means nothing without the cross. So let us see the cross in our celebration today as we take the elements today. So if I'd invite those that are come to pass out the elements today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're invited to join us in taking the elements. If you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I would ask you simply to refrain and reflect on what you've seen today. No one's passing judgment. But this is a gift and a celebration for the community of faith. And so as we celebrate today, let me pray as the elements get passed in just a moment. Reflect on what we've heard seen, what we've experienced in the love of Christ and the cross of Christ. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing a community together, your church, 
we were recognized here as a group called Cross Life. Father, I thank you for this body and that we can come together and celebrate all you are and all you've done, the salvation you bring, the forgiveness and mercy and grace that is all part of who you are and what was accomplished on the cross. Father, as we take these elements today, let us reflect on all they are and all they represent. Father, help us to to be overwhelmed with joy for what you have done and what you will do in your return. We pray in Jesus' name. We are celebrating the season of Advent, celebrating the Advent that is part of his first coming. He has come, and he promises to come again. His second advent. Pray with me. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you will indeed come again. That you are preparing a place for us. And when we join you, there will be a celebration. marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, we're grateful. So grateful for your spirit being left with us to reside in and with us and through us. Father, as we celebrate this week as our anticipation of the celebration of Christmas and even the anticipation of your second coming fills us with joy this week. May we go out from this place overwhelmed by the joy that has been promised to us and the joy that has been given to us and the joy that can exude in us as we live out your call in our life to share with others, to be part and celebrate your seeking and finding the lost. God's church says amen.